It's easy to hear your favorite artist on WFPK from wherever you are. Listen on your smart speaker, live stream from our website at WFPK.org from Louisville Public Media. Consequence Podcast Network. Welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with. It's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org, Consequence, and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thank you so much for making your way here and checking out the series. I hope you know what to do. At this point, uh, hit that subscribe button if you like what you hear. I put out three new interviews every single week. That's a new one every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So it's a great way to keep up with your favorite artists, discover some new ones, and know what's happening in the music world. At all the usual spots like iTunes and Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Acast, Podchaser, NPR, YouTube for the video versions, or anywhere you get your podcasts from. I'm Kyle Mayer, and today I'm talking with Glenn Hughes. We're going to be discussing Holy Ground. That's the new album that he's done with the Dead Daisies. Now, the former Deep Purple Black Sabbath singer is going to be talking about what it's been like to play uh, live shows post-lockdown, joining the Dead Daisies in 2019, and bringing a 70s fill to their catalog. Uh, Glenn's also going to go into singing about letting go of fear and the things we can't control, overcoming addiction, and covering 30 days in the hole, as well as giving us a big tip that the band are completing an album that he thinks might be released next year. So let's do this, discussing Holy Ground. It's Kyle Meredith with Glenn Hughes of the Dead Daisies. Hi, Todd. How are you? I'm great, man. It's such a pleasure to talk to you again. Um, first off, want to say congrats on this new record with the Dead Daisies, Holy Ground. I know it came out earlier this year, but uh, it's been a powerful listen. Thank you, man. Thank you. It means a lot to me. Thank you. And now you guys are going to be doing the tour um, that uh, that's happening all this fall. How has it been? Because I know you've done yeah. some uh, some dates with the Get Out of the House dates so far. Ha- has it felt different this time around? Um, well, we start again tomorrow. Um, so when we saw you on July the 3rd, it was the, the third or fourth show we did. Um it was great. We, I just went, we, had, we had three days in the resort. We had such a good time there. Uh, I want to thank all the people that came to see our show there. It was one of the first shows. and you, you were very important in getting us up and running. So as we march forward now, we're going to be playing a lot more shows and we look forward to doing that. But just, you know, especially after being... Uh... I don't know if sidelined is the right word, but I mean, everybody's been was sidelined for about a year there. I mean, yeah, have you noticed a difference with the, with the interaction? In the I mean, is it business as usual once you take that stage, or does it actually feel different this time? Well, it doesn't really. We all, everybody knows the scenario. The audience and the band and the crew and the staff and people that work with us. We all know the parameters of what we can and we can't do. Um, the only difference is, and I think fans get it but they don't quite get it because we if one of us gets sick the whole thing is false you know so we got to be very careful and fans of people got to be careful we can't do any mingling right now i think everybody knows this so once that, that has been said it's easier to maneuver so but when we do the show it's going to be the same kind of vibe the same thing happening it's just that we can't do any sort of physical interactions with anyone it's a, it's a shame but this is the way it is at the moment well it does feel like some of these songs um a song like come alive uh, it certainly feels like it could read the room right now you know uh, and i say that from a fan's perspective when you know maybe it has been a long time since you've seen a live show have you noticed any songs really sort of speaking to the moment more than you thought they might that one specifically has been, has been doing that for me. I, look, isn't it, isn't it crazy, Kyle, that these lyrics that I wrote pre-pandemic, when you read, if people read my lyrics, it's like, it's, I'm, I'm not chuckling to myself, but I'm thinking these lyrics are, they're pandemic-style lyrics, but I didn't know anything about it. But like, come alive, I'm thinking about, we've got to come alive, you know, we can start over. All these songs are—they go over so well, you know. It's, it's interesting just how the timeline played out because you had just joined the band a few years ago and, and recorded all of this, of course, before the pandemic, and, and then it happened. Did you feel like 
Like you've been in a lot of bands through the years. Did did having something like this happen affect your sense of being a band member differently than it would have otherwise? No, it, it's no, it, it 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 just happened. You know, all these things happen for a reason, as you know. And being in this band at this time was supposed to be, uh, and, and having the pandemic we're going through, unfortunately, it was supposed to be. All these things we're going through right now were supposed to happen for whatever reason, but they are lessons to be learned. Well, I'd love to hear about, you know, making Holy Ground, and uh, especially, like, what was different about writing this with this group for you, if anything? Like, how did you approach these songs? Well, they primarily brought me in because of my songs, you know. They wanted a songwriter, a singing songwriter, who was more influenced, because I'm a 70s guy, you know, I had a major success in the 70s. So they wanted... They were primarily an eighties sounding band before I joined. They wanted you to, to have a seventies approach. So when I brought the songs in, I, I brought Unspoken in and, and My Fate and like no other and far away these songs I brought with me uh, and hoping that they would tick the boxes and, and and they did, so I was very happy about that. Did you was it one of those things where you can look and see what your mind was sort of on, lyrically speaking, uh, around that time? Yeah, as I say, I'm fascinated by the, the, the topic of, of songs I was writing. I, I, I've always, I've been, I think my lifestyle changed 30 years ago when I, when I got out of the fast line. I started to write about fact, rather than fiction. And my topic uh, for the last 30 years, it's been about letting go, walking through the fear and letting go of, attach- of attachments that no longer serve us. And on the Holy Ground album, these topics are very, very realistic. How so? Like, uh, I-, I guess I'd be asking what you're letting go of these days. Oh, uh, letting go of things that I can't control. I mean, you know, I- as young men and women, we think we- we've got all the control, and we don't control anything. The only control we have is this this moment, right, I'm talking to you in this moment right now, the only thing I kind of have control of is, is, is this conversation I'm having with you. It's a great conversation, we're talking about what we're talking about. But in a second, it's going to be past. It's gone. And then comes the next moment. And what I'm trying to convey on the lyrical content, Kyle, on this album is that we, if I may suggest, we have to live in the moment. We can't live what just happened a moment ago, because it's already gone. It's gone now. And the moment we live in, in this very precious single second of a moment, it's the only thing that counts. Consciousness exists only in this moment. No, it's well said, and and, and you're absolutely... I mean, I agree with you 100%. I find it's... This might not be exactly what you're speaking to, but, you know, being someone who has so much history in rock and roll as you... You know, to live in the moment and to be so often held to your past. You know, from folks like me, always asking questions about the oh. old days. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how about a, a, a crazy? I've, listen, I've had a wonderful life. I have not had. I, I have a wonderful life. Been doing this for fifty years. I've stepped through many minefields, minefields, and uh, and overcome every addiction you can imagine. And I'm still here doing what I do, looking out my window in New York today in Central Park, thinking how wonderful it is to be alive on our planet, a planet that has gone through so much crap this last 19, 20 months that we're still here doing what we do. Well, I, I, you know, kind of hitting on the past really quickly, I'll only bring up that uh, you guys do cover 30 Days in the Hole. It, it's a fantastic cover. Um, Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Was there any reason, like, I was looking back at the timeline, like, you would have been, what, in Trapeze when that came out? Um, like, what yeah. What about that song still speaks to you today? Why Why still do it? Well, Steve, Steve was a good friend of mine, and I've known, I've known Steve since 1971. Um, so when we did that song, I wanted to, for me, it was my honor to do something to honor my dear friend who I love. So anything to do with Steve Murray, I was, it wasn't my suggestion to do that song. Uh, somebody suggested we do that. So if we're going to do a song that my friend wrote, I just wanted to make sure it was a good, a, a good version. It's a, it's a great version. Not even just good. I'd say it's great. <laughs> um, 
I, I did uh, read that you had said you also wrote a lot of songs during the pandemic. Do you know where they're going to end up? Is that Future Dead Daisies? Are you thinking about more oh, solo stuff? stuff on that. Yeah, you know, um, I wrote last summer, uh, I'm kind of giving you an exclusive now, Carl. I wrote a whole new album last summer, a year ago, um, which we are now actually giving you kind of an exclusive. Um, we're, we're planning on hopefully... I don't get in trouble telling you this. We're planning on recording it at the end of the year, so wow. yeah. Wow, is this a solo record? No, it's a dead, another dead daisy. Okay, another dead daisies. Yeah, that's that's what I didn't pick up on right there. Well, that's fantastic. That's amazing, and and that's time well spent. It sounds like <laughs> for the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, last summer, I mean, I figuratively, no one knew about this, but now they do because I'm talking to you. Um, I, I I went in my studio and. So came over and I, I came up with ten songs that that are I don't know man that's pretty pretty amazing stuff I can't wait to to record them. Well, I certainly cannot wait to hear them. Uh, thank you for that. And in the meantime, uh, Glenn, congratulations again on Holy Ground. I've loved listening to this and 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 just the chemistry that you all have together is so much fun. So, congrats and thanks for taking the time to talk about it. Thank you, Carla. And one more thing, Louisville, Kentucky. I love you so much. Thank you so much for being there, July the third. And my friends in Louisville, I will see you again. You have no problem with me coming there. I love you so much. Thank you. Awesome. I cannot wait. Thanks, Glenn. Take care. Thank you, Carl. Thank you so much. Now, I'm going to include a couple other interviews, an older interview with Glenn Hughes. But first, I want to include an interview that I uh, I had with uh, Dean Castronovo and Doug Aldrich of the Dead Daisies that we recorded back in 2018 to talk about recording in Nashville for their uh, fourth LP, Burn It Down. We discussed the single Rise Up and a few uh, rock star stories involving Dio, uh, Whitesnake, and Ozzy, who uh, infamously would shave off an eyebrow once you fell asleep. So uh, here's part two of Kyle Meredith with the Dead Daisies. Kyle! What's up, dude? It's good to talk to you both. This is uh, good to be talking to you, my friend. Uh, congratulations on this new record with Burn It Down. This is some exciting stuff. Well, yeah, dude. We had a blast making this record. Uh, obviously, my first one with the Dead Daisies. and uh, The chemistry and the vibe was just amazing. And I, I believe we come up with a, an amazing record this time. I mean, it's killer. Yeah. I love it. And you guys did the sessions in, uh, in Nashville, right? Yeah, we did them at Marty Fredrickson's studio in Nashville. And it's just a great vibe there. You can set up and kind of rehearse. And once you... Get a get a vibe on a song. You can just throw it down and get it on tape. You know, it's it's a really productive um, place for us. You know, you go into it. I, I read some. Maybe it was a press release or something. You know, somebody said it's an old school rock record. I, I sort of wondered. You know, how does that work for you all with a collective like this? Is there an idea going into it, or do you just get in the room and, and jam it out and see what happens? How does it work? We do everything as a band, and and uh, it's very much you know uh, an equal thing where everyone's. Everyone's in, involved, invested into the ideas. And so say, for example, I might have an idea for a riff or something, and then Dean would have a, an idea of where to take that. And then Marco would say, well, let's try it in this key. And then John would say, you know, oh, that's cool. We could put it and, and it all kind of... It's a, it's like a real band, believe it or not, and uh, and then we, uh, we 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 how many songs do we have like twenty five songs in the end, and then yeah. Marty Fredrickson, the producer, who is really is very instrumental in everything, the sound and the direction of this record, he um, he produced us and and he made he he brought out the best in us. Now, Dean, you you you're the newest guy in this collective right here. What you came in last late last year, right? Yeah, um, actually, November, uh, uh, Doug had, had called me and asked me if I was available. I came, and I said, yeah, of course, and they uh, flew me in to meet the band, and then three days later, I was in Nashville getting ready to record the record. So, yeah, it was really quick, but yeah, my first one, I love it. I just love it. <laughs> and that's it's one of the most interesting things about the Dead Daisies, too, because... Uh, you know, I don't want to call it a revolving door because I always think that sounds wrong, uh, although I don't mean it in a wrong way. But there have been so many different members over a lifetime of this band. How hard or difficult or, or easy is it to find a common thread when writing and record an album from album to album? That's a great question. I mean, I think that it start, the Dead Days is kind of started off a little bit different than a lot of bands where you had a guy, we had David Lowy and, and the original singer, John Stevens, uh, working on some songs, and then they they decided, well, let's make a record. Who do, who can we get? They just you know found some session guys, and then it's just taken a while to, to find the right pieces. But this lineup is, I will say, it's it's really exciting to work with these guys, especially with the energy that Dean brought in. You know, you never want 
want anyone to leave. But if if it's amicable and it's an amicable split, which it was, then that's cool. And then Dean came in and just he lifted the whole thing up, you know. And we don't want to make the exact same record twice, so. Um, the, the direction of the songs was a little different. Having Dean's energy, you know, his sexy vibe on the skin, <laughs> the way he, just, you know, strokes those skin. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa! <laughs> and then, um, but the, 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 I'll tell you the truth. It all comes down to Krabi because he's the thread. He's the, you know, when you the singers, the it's all about the singer, really. And and going to the back catalog, I mean, you know. Everybody sort of wants to usually usually put their own you know stamp on a song. Do you notice that the the older songs from like the first record start to really change? Are you are you playing those live? Yeah, we play a little bit of from everything, and they they do. I mean, you try and keep it uh, as close as you can to the the, the song, but you, you know everyone has a certain style of the way that they play, and, and so it's inevitably going to have a little bit of a, a twist of the new of this lineup, which is uh, which is really strong. Cool. And, and the songs we've heard so far, by the way, Resurrected and Rise Up, such powerful songs. Even just taking on those two titles right there, it seems like, you know, you're calling on something here. Well, you know, I, I, I was talking to John a little bit about Resurrected, and I said, what, what were you thinking when you were writing that song? What, were, what, what was in your head? And he goes, you know, he, and he said, I kind of wrote it about me and, and you, Dean. It was kind of like, you know... Uh, you know, John, with being a Motley Crue and all of that stuff, he was saying, well, everybody thought, you know, they're just going to write me off. I'm, you know, I'm just going to write off into the sunset. But uh, he came back strong, man, big, big and strong with the Dead Daisies. And uh, it's kind of him saying, you know, I'm back. You know, I'm not dead. I'm not gone. I'm here. And, uh, you know, I've still got damage, you know, to do. So and the same thing with me, you know, it was, you know, everybody kind of wrote me off, too. And here I am. And, and things are good, man. I mean, to take two sides of a coin on a song like that, too, because, you know, it's written about something such, uh, something so personal uh, as your own, you know, lives and careers, yet it fits sort of this overall theme, uh, you know, the way it works out right there and the big sound of the record, I guess. Uh, it's really cool the way that plays out. The direction of the record, we definitely wanted to focus on some, some simple, heavy riffs and stuff that because we do a lot of festivals and, and even in... Even at smaller gigs, I mean, it's just the simple riffs really hook people. So stuff like Rise Up was just, um, it's just right away easy to catch, you know? Yeah. I don't know if you can speak to the lyrics on that one, too. I mean, uh, it's it's said that this is sort of a protest song, right? The, that's, again, that's something that I think John mentioned. But to me, it's it's the feeling in the morning when you wake up. Yeah. Morning wood, rise up, <laughs> get up, get some coffee, and go Go kick ass, man. That's what it's about. Go, rise up and kick ass today, and and do something positive. Those are the, that's the way I read into it. Yeah, I'm the same way with that thing. You know, it's like uh, you know, there's so much stuff going on in the world today. You know, whatever political views you have or you know, religious views you have. I mean, there's so much divisiveness. You know, everybody's so you know this or this, and you know, for for I think what John was was trying to convey was, hey, you know, we need to come together and speak as one. You know, and and try to make change in the world as as you know, a, one people instead of you know factions and you know that kind of thing. It's really cool. I, I I need to ask though, you know, with with as many different acts as you all have been a part, just the two of you, you know, White Snake, Dio, Bad English, Journey, just all of these bands. You've got to tell me that there are some great war stories that you guys get to trade. You know, when the when the lights are off. Totally, there's tons of them, man. I mean, there was a. I'll tell you a funny story that was. Um, that was uh, I actually did at one point, and I was in Dio for a while and got comfortable. And Ronnie used to always put his his clothes up to dry and stuff. And one night we were on the bus party, and I told him, I go, Ronnie, I could, I bet you, man, I could, I could fit in those pants. And he goes, Nope, couldn't do it. <laughs> and I did, I tried them on, and we we had a we had a picture of it. And it was funny. Well, I got I got a good story when I was in bad English. Uh, we're sitting in, in a plane, and and John Wayne bet me a hundred bucks to crawl up on the plane, into first class, and beg for peanuts. And I did it. <laughs> and he paid me. It was awesome. <laughs> did you get the peanuts? I did. Yeah. And, and, you know, that was before 9-11 and all that stuff, so I think they were a little bit more lax with, you know, who we were and stuff. But, yeah, nowadays that would not fly. There's, there's so many stories. Every day there's something that happens with these guys, with these bands. I mean, Dean and I are pretty mellow in terms of that stuff. But, like, one time with with Whitesnake, David, would he had... Uh, he had his assistant set up his room and get all the, the tapestries on the walls in his room. Every day, there'd be, you know, his room's decorated and they'd candles everywhere. And uh, he, they went out shopping, he and his assistant, and the band rolls up 
and we get in the hotel and just got my bags in the room and all of a sudden the fire alarm goes off and we are waiting out front the, police, the fire company comes and uh you know puts out the fire and david comes walking what's all this and what, which one of you which one of my three cold wonders started this fire you know and, and i was like dude it was your room that was on fire you did it. and one of the candles melted the toilet and the toilet exploded and that's what happened <laughs> but David, you know, of course, he thought it was one of us. Yeah. Oh, I got a fire one story. I got a fire one too. When, <laughs> when I was with Ozzy, uh, Motorhead was on the road with us, and sure enough, it was Lemmy that pulled it at like five in the morning. Pulled the thing. Everybody in Europe, everybody's coming out, and you know, there's Lemmy and Mickey D, and they're all just sitting there, and they're just like, "Wow, man, who did this?" And Lemmy just, you know, kind of standing there with a grin on his face. Well, we all knew it was him. It was great. I don't Have think you... Ozzy left though. He stayed in the room. That reminds me, Ozzy is the famous one that used to shave one eyebrow off people. Yeah. yeah. And one of our crew guys was in Japan hanging out with the Japanese crew, and they were all getting really drunk. And the Japanese crew heard a story about that Ozzy shaved the keyboards keyboard players, one of his eyebrows off, and he went in to go to the bathroom and on the bus, and he's like, ah, what happened? So these guys, one of their friends showed up late, and they made him power drink, and he passed out, and then all of a sudden, it's like, who's got a razor? Take <laughs> the did. other one off. So Ozzy was famous for that. Yeah, who's going to bring that one on tour? You're going you're gonna to bring that <laughs> onto this tour. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm probably going to be the one that's going to be hazed because I'm the new guy. Yeah. So I'm sure I'll have no eyebrows, half a beard. You know, I don't know. Maybe they'll write stuff on my forehead that can never come off. I have no clue yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited to hear if all that happens. Uh, good luck on the tour out there. I see you're going to be all over the uh, all over the world on this thing. Uh, it looks like it's a pretty awesome year for you guys lined up. So we're going to be really busy. We're very excited, and we really appreciate the support for the band. And Burn yeah. It Down is going to, um, you know, be fun to play, and we want people to come out and see us. We got some uh, U.S. dates in what? Yep, uh, August fifteenth we yeah. start, and uh, I think we end around the twenty sixth of September in Los Angeles. So check yeah. out uh, the dead daisies dot com and uh, for for you know dates and and just keeping up with the band. We're really into the social media thing, so fans can really be a part of it. Well, Dean Doug, it's so great talking to you. Thanks so much for taking the time today, and uh, and congrats. Uh, thank you, Kyle. Appreciate it, man. Thanks. Again, thanks for the support, man. Thanks, thank you, brother. All right, take care. Bye, brother. As I mentioned, there's a, another time, an earlier time, that Glenn and I had spoken. Again, back in uh, 2018, the voice of rock. He was set up for a very busy year, just having been part of Joe Satriani's released uh, in uh, for uh, the album What's Next, in which he played bass on, uh, that he would be performing classic Deep Purple songs on a worldwide tour. We talked about that. And uh, possibly getting back into the studio with uh, Black Country Communion as well. And we talk about his involvement with uh, Rock Against Trafficking, and all the uh, police cover benefit compilation. So here's part three, Kyle Meredith with Glenn Hughes. Hi, Kyle. How are you? I know one of the things we're talking about, uh, plenty here, but uh, you're part of a compilation for Rock Against Trafficking, right? Covering uh, yes, the police's I am. I, uh, I am. And, uh, you know, obviously, Kyle, getting into this, uh, I had to educate myself because we as a people in America, I, I'm, I'm being respectful when I say this, we don't um, know the statistics of what it is and how many people get abducted. But let me just tell you, Kyle, this is second behind drug and alcohol addiction. The uh, billions of dollars each year are changed hands. Can you imagine someone coming into your home in the day, in the night, and taking a sibling, a parent, a kid, whatever, and then you never seeing them again? To, 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 to know unthinkable things are going on. And my job, our job, is to carry the message to everyone listening and reading and, and uh, carrying the message that we must come together and, and help one another to stop this from happening. It's such a crazy thing that this is still, you know, uh, happening in 2018. But uh, you're right. As I look at those statistics too, it's just kind of mind blowing how widespread the whole thing still is. You know, Elizabeth Smart was one of the lucky ones. You know, when she uh, found her way back to her family. But you know, it's it's when you know I've been involved in this for a while now, and knowing what I know, it's it's I, I'm eager to tell Americans, my, my family of uh, Americans, that, that we, we've got to educate each other on this. Can you, I, I can't imagine someone coming into your home and doing that and, and then knowing that you've lost the uh, always waiting and hoping they'd come back. But no, you know, child slavery, kidnapping, abductions, it's going on as we speak. And, and to kind of spread the word about this, there is the compilations put out there. You covered um, uh, Police's Roxanne? Yeah, it's all... It's all police songs. 
Uh, it's a good call because Sting is an incredible songwriter, and uh, he, he only writes about the human condition, and this is what we're all about, by the way. I, re I only really like to write and sing songs about human condition, and uh, when I was singing Roxanne, I got all caught up in the lyric, and, you know, obviously it's not about what this project is, but it, to me, I took it there about, you know, the loneliness and about, you know, sadness. And, and because we want people to understand that, that this is a very sensitive issue and we must, we must educate one another. Yeah, it's an interesting turn for that song too because, you know, in those original lyrics, you don't have to turn on the red light and we all know sort of what um, he's talking about there. But then yeah, for you yeah. to give it backstory in, in sort of a, a really interesting way, an unfortunately horrible way, but an interesting way. Well, you know what it is? I'm singing at the start of the song, Love You Since I Knew You, I Wouldn't Talk Down To You. I'm basically singing to those poor unfortunates that have been taken, and I'm also singing to the people that are taking. I want people to know that I'm not frightened of this, and it's something that, you know, I'm going to, you know, meet head on uh, as uh, we move forward, because we've got to be of service, Kyle. Uh, I want to talk about some of your other projects you got going on, because you are one of the busiest men in all of music, uh, it seems like. <laughs> I just spoke to your buddy Joe Satriani, uh, what, a week or two ago, and you're part of his latest record, too. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, was it a big challenge for you to be part of a vocalist album? No, it's, isn't that crazy? I mean, you know, you gotta, you got to get a visual. You know, after each song, I'd say to Joe, you didn't hear a vocal line in that song? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was kind of half-joking, because that's the only album I've ever done where I didn't sing, and I've done over 150 records, so... Um, yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was beautiful for me to, to just play bass and rest my voice for a minute, you know? Yeah, I mean, the irony, of course, uh, of course is the voice of rock is completely silenced. The, the, voice, the voice of rock is in the building and he's gagged. Yeah, he's gagged. <laughs> Yeah. It's a really fun record to listen to. I love what you guys did on that. Uh, it's a great. We we played on, on in L.A. on Friday night. Uh, Chad and I with Joe and Phil and, and John Petrucci. He was fantastic. Yeah, I saw some of the clips on that. Uh, I know you've got a tour coming up where you're going to be playing Deep Purple songs, the classic Deep Purple songs that you were a part yeah, of, and yeah. some of the other ones. No, Carl. What I'm doing is I've never really embraced the, the heritage of a complete Glenn Hughes Deep Purple show of all the songs I wrote and contributed back in the day, and I've never really ever done a complete show. We started touring last September, October in uh, Australia, New Zealand, and, and now we can, we're going next, we're going to be in, uh, in South America, and then we're going to be heading over to Europe to do all the festivals, and I'm coming back to, to play Pacific Rim, and then go to Africa, and then finish up in North America early next year. I mean, there's so many different eras for you to sing from. What like brings you back to those Deep Purple songs? What what is it that really attracts you still to that era for you? What what I do, Kyle, I get into character. You know, I I, I kind of remember the way it was, and I'm not really one that likes to go back. But now I'm looking at my life. It, I've been doing this for 50 years now, and you know, looking at what I've done and. And, and, you know, being inducted into the Hall of Fame and all the awards, all that's fantastic, don't get me wrong, I love very appreciative. But I want to, if I'm going to do a show like this, and by the way, it's a full production show, and if I'm going to do a show, I'm going to honor the legacy, and I'm going to, what I'm actually doing, Kyle, is I'm playing arrangements from live recordings from the 70s, not studio, mm -hmm. so it's an interesting mix. So it's a bit of California jam, it's a little bit of, the, of Made in Europe, a little bit of Made in Japan. It's, it's like a live combination of the, the not, it's not studio arrangements, it's more of a, uh, a wild uh, live arrangements of songs. I can't wait to see what that uh, looks like, sounds like, the whole thing. It sounds like a lot of fun. And, yeah, uh, it's, it's fantastic. Huh? Really, really happy, man. Really yeah. grateful. And then, of course, uh, Black Country Communion. Uh, like I said, there's so many things to talk to you about. What's the update there? Because now it's it's back on. You got a new record. Well, we, you know, we, Joe and I got together and uh, we wrote in my studio the whole record. And, you know, we just did a couple of big shows in the UK. And, and we're going to do a cruise at the end of February down to Miami to, to Jamaica, which will be fun. And then we all go our separate ways. Jason's, of course, got the Led Zeppelin experience. J Derek's got Sons of Apollo, a band with Mike. Mike Poitnoy, and I'm doing GHDP Classic. So we're, what we're trying to do, Carl, is we're trying to keep the, 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 bo the boat flowing uh, as we all do our uh, individual things, and uh, long may that continue. Uh, the, the really cool thing about you know how you write, and especially on that last record, is what you said. You, you were writing about such specific topics, really minute, specific topics, and it seemed like it was almost like a writing workshop for you to kind of get in that. Because, I mean, what are you... 
killing dolphins uh, was one of them. Like I said, I mean, where do these I ideas mean, arrive for you? Well, you know, as you can, if you read the lyrics on the albums I write, uh, everything I write since I've been clean and sober, it's all about giving back and, and being of service. I, you know, when I changed my lifestyle all those years ago, I I wanted to to give back. You know, I asked. I asked my higher power if I could just have one more day on this planet, I'd give my, my love back, you know. And that's what I do. I'm very involved with, with, with charities, you know, especially, you know, animal, you know, the dolphin. I'm an ambassador for dolphin, Rico Barry's the Dolphin Project, where in, in each year between October and March, uh, hundreds of thousands of dolphins are slaughtered and, and for captivity or killed or for human consumption in Japan. And it's a, a humongous tragedy. And my job is to carry that message. I'm, the song of the Cove on Black Country is a bit of an epic song, and I'm, I get all teary in that song. And uh, I want people to know that I just want to be of service as long as I'm alive on this planet. I just got to give back. That's a great mantra right there. I, I really appreciate everything that you've done uh, in art and for music and for the fans. And it was a, it was a pleasure talking to you, Glenn. And uh, thank you so much, Carl. And have a great, great day, everybody. And peace and love. All right. Take care. Thank you, Carl. And again, my thanks to Glenn Hughes. The new album from the Dead Daisies is called A Holy Ground. Big thanks to you as well for uh, checking out the episode and the podcast. Hit that subscribe button before you get out of here at iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Acast, Podchaser, NPR, YouTube for the video versions, or anywhere you like to get your podcast from. Subscribe to Kyle Meredith with for three new interviews every single week. After that, head over to WFPK.org. That's where I'm hanging out Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern, for an hour full of song premieres, music news, anniversary spins, and bonus interviews. That's Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern at WFPK.org. Consequence has your music and film news. You can also find me on the social media spots, including uh, Instagram, Twitter, Twitter, and Facebook, all three of them, at Kyle Meredith. I do hope you like and follow along. That does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network. It's easy to hear your favorite artist on WFPK from wherever you are. Listen on your smart speaker, live stream from our website at WFPK.org from Louisville Public Media.